Hello and welcome to my thesis presentation. This is my senior thesis and it is titled White Rose Resistance and Why Hans and Sophie Scholl are Still Important Today. And my name is Sean Lamborn. And the reason why I picked this topic was because uh, many know some sort of narrative of the events of World War II in some regard, and I started learning about European history and World War II back in about, I think, 10th grade. Yeah, it was 10th grade that I got a glimpse into more about what World War II was, and it's kind of what I got more interested into, despite the fact that it's a more morbid thing to be interested in. But I, it's also interesting to me because I've always had this question on my mind of what were things like in Germany during that time? I mean, we get the common core United States curriculum presentation that the allied powers were the biggest thing they were they are the focus and that all of nazi germany was a bad thing but what happened inside and how did people within germany react and based upon other historical knowledge since history is my major i had an idea that not everybody in the country would have accepted all the new changes it's not very common that you're going to have somebody come in and create all sorts of major changes, and that's what Hitler did. He completely created a new system. Well, he did restore the economy, which was part of the reason why so many people were drawn to him. He still created so much change, and there are some people who aren't going to be as accepting of that. That sort of thing happened with Napoleon. Uh, he declared himself emperor. He eventually got dethroned. Caesar did the same thing. He changed it from what basically was a republic or a democracy into an empire, made himself emperor, and while it became the Roman Empire after that, he was still killed for it, so there's not always going to be this acceptance of change, and so I wanted to see how people were inside of it, particularly having this initial idea, I wanted to see, well, what about resistance in Germany? I mean, if there's not going to be people accepting it, there's going to be people resisting it. And I started turning that into my idea for my senior thesis. I know I had to do this project from freshman year, even from senior year of high school, I kind of had this idea of like, oh, I know I'm going to have to do a thesis project, so why not start thinking about it now? And then it's uh, junior year of college, I did a course for researching, and that kind of is where I started the ball rolling for my idea. And originally, I began to notice actually that uh, grassroots resistance, that's way too broad of a topic because you have um, Jewish-German resistance, you have married German resistance, people who were married to German Jews who didn't want to, you know, see their spouses get given up to the Nazi regime and killed for it. And I realized, oh, there's a lot of this type of resistance. So that's going to be way too broad of a topic for a paper. So I went through all of them and found one that was applicable and interesting, and that was the story of Hans and Sophie Scholl and the organization of the White Rose, and that was because they were both college students in a university in Munich, and I mean, they're around my age, and they're resisting the Nazi regime. They're in my situation, they are college students, and they're resisting this massive regime. I kind of have to know more about it. I wanted to know more. So I started delving into it and wanted to figure out why, I mean, if at all, their story, how their story could be applicable now, because I'm a college student, and 
well, what can I take from this? And what can you audience take from this as well? So here's where we start. Hans and Sophie Scholl were two of six children born to the parents of, well, born to parents Robert and Magdalena Scholl. Robert had a little bit better of a start on him. He had success to him. He was a mayor of two towns in his life. Um, eventually, Ulm, where a lot of um, Sophie and Hans's childhood was. And he was also a businessman. Magdalena was a medical student and an evangelical Christian. So you have these two different... I mean, you have these two backgrounds and the children being raised with said background. So you're going to have them exposed to a different lifestyle than what was typically found in Germany at that time. And also, Robert was very politically involved and he even refused to fight in World War I on political grounds. So he was very politically involved so if he's politically involved, he's obviously going to discuss it in the household. And so Hans and Sophia were going to be around that. And so with going back to the positions, the uh, occupations of Robert and Magdalena, and why that's important, during the time they were growing up, not, um, Germany was actually going through its major recession as a result of the Treaty of Versailles and world the aftermath of World War I and the stock market crash in the United States in the 1930s. You had a lot of things, and in Germany at that time, practically, it was more useful to burn the money you had than to spend it on bread. Because bread was so expensive, and having heat was essential. They had to survive somehow, so they would just burn their money to keep warm. And since they had this little bit better off um, upbringing, they were able to experience a little bit differently. They were afforded luxuries that many others wouldn't experience, and... They didn't have to go through the sufferings of many people in Germany during that time. And Robert and Magdalena would encourage their children to spend time outdoors. And uh, Hans and Sophie would go hiking, go playing in the forest, stuff like that. And this nurtured a love for their country. Now, why is that important? Come 1930s when Hitler started to rise, you have Hitler um, actually exploiting this pride in their nation. I'm going to go back to the previous slide in a minute, but I want to get to this point. And he would, his most powerful weapon was his ability to sit there and go, we, are, uh, we need to rebuild this nation and make it great again. That also phrase is going to become relevant later on for other reasons, and I'm sure you can already guess what they are. But he would invoke this German concept of, and I'm probably going to butcher this, I'm going to try the best I can, Volksgemeinschaft, which it's this sense of community amongst the German people. He would use that and say, we need to be one great people. We can make this nation better and bring it up. He used that as a weapon. And Sophie and Hans actually fell for this because they, since they had seen the beauty of the countryside, they had seen the great things their country had, they knew they wanted to protect that. They knew they wanted to make that, keep that, and nurture it. And so that's why that was an important thing with them being raised the way they were. And... Their father gave them the political voice. He was always a strong political voice in their life. His opinions rarely changed. He was against the regime from the very beginning. He often would, 
and I had wolves and deceivers. That's what uh, Robert would call the Nazi regime. It's like they're wolves and deceivers. Do not trust them. And he was very strongly against Hans and Sophie participating in the regime in any way, including the Hitler Youth programs. And everybody knows, or most of you should know, what Hitler Youth was. The closest comparison we have here is Boy Scouts. That's basically the type of thing it would be. You would take them on trips for particular purpose, and that particular purpose being um, indoctrination. Not saying the Boy Scouts do that, but that's how the Hitler Youth worked. And while there was the Hitler Youth for the boys, there was also the other group for the women during this time, and it had a different name. And the shortened version of that would be called the BDM, because the um, primary name is Bund Deutscher Madel. And that was the girls' league of all of this. And they participated in that. They willingly went into these programs. It was still voluntary for them to join these programs. They weren't forced to do it. It wasn't until a couple of years later that those things came compulsory, that the Nazi party said all youth are to join these programs. At that point, after, if you had not joined, you would be in contempt of the Nazi party and held in suspicion. And so while in the Hitler Youth, Hans would end up becoming a troop leader. So he went up and ascended the ranks within the first two years of joining. Sophie didn't rise as highly, but she still willingly participated within the program. And their father would have arguments with particularly Hans in their home of their disapproval. So he was adamantly against it. Of course, he wasn't going out in the streets and proclaiming his distrust of the Nazi party. That was a dangerous thing. But he would, in his home, very strongly disapprove of it. And Hans and Sophie never turned him in. But still, there was that dynamic. And this was the two different things they were raised in. The love for their country, the beauty. But they were also raised with their um, anti-Nazi father. And eventually Hans had a fierce dedication, but eventually that would begin to crack because the Hitler Youth in Ulm, which is where they were living, as I stated earlier, the leaders were inept at what they were doing. They really didn't get the whole thing. They didn't grasp the ideology. They weren't really into it, so they didn't really like the system for the Hitler Youth, and so they asked Hans to restart a youth group, which would become known as the DJ-111. And that was because of the date they were founded on November 1st. And Hans was in charge of this, so he got to decide how things were. And it became a more free-thinking youth group than what the Hitler Youth was. And it gave Hans a new perspective on things. It became... Uh, a way for him to see how rigid the Nazi party was, and he didn't begin to like that after some time. Eventually, this group was ordered to be disbanded because of this. There was too much free thinking, and there wasn't the indoctrination that the Nazi party was hoping. They felt it served its purpose, is what they were saying. But, of course, they're not going to openly say, it's not going with our ideals, get rid of it now. But Hans actually didn't disband the group. And like I said, this group is where he started to be more free-thinking, to be more resistant to things. So he kept the group meeting in secret. And he still kept this group going. And in 1935, it's kind of the year that started things going downhill for Hans, at least, in terms of his views of the um, Nazi party. Sophie still took a little bit of time before this, but 1935 was when the Treaty of Versailles began to uh, become a really big thing, and Hitler actually broke any articles in the treaty, and he began to remilitarize Germany, and 
made it compulsory for people to join the military. And it was this year also that saw the Nuremberg rallies. Hitler held these rallies in Nuremberg. He would hold yearly rallies, but he decided to hold rallies in Nuremberg. He made it all pretty. He made these statues. He made these new buildings through slave labor. At that time, he was using um, work camps. So he was using the work camps to make these beautiful things in Nuremberg. And he wanted to show that pride to the nation. He was using that pride in the nation against everybody. But Hans kind of saw through that. He was still running the DJ-11. And he had, uh, he was actually stripped of his leadership role only to be restored if he were to disband the group. But at the Nuremberg rallies, he saw too much rigidity in everything. He began to doubt everything. And the Nuremberg rallies were also the beginning of the obvious anti-Jewish sent sentiment, and this is where certain anti-Jewish laws came into. And this is kind of where Sophie begins to see things as, uh, crumble as well, because she had a friend that got rejected from the Hitler Youth because she was Jewish. Of course, she chose to ignore it for some time and she continued to participate but occasionally she would show this behavior that wasn't conforming necessarily with what the Nazi party was having because she eventually became a leader of her troop and during one of those times of the leadership a particularly higher up in the Hitler youth came to visit her troop and she actually recommended a banned Jewish author because she enjoyed the author. And she should have known that this was against Nazi party regulations, but she still did it anyway. So this is kind of showing the beginning of the fact that she wasn't conforming. Uh, both Hans and Sophie actually ended up becoming exposed to Catholicism, which was also uh, frowned upon by the Nazis. In fact, highly discriminated against. It, um, Germany was a predominantly Protestant country, and Catholicism wasn't going to conform with anything the Nazi party was putting out. The Nazi party was more comfortable with any religion that they could put their hold on and keep their ideologies in. Catholicism was not that. And it's odd because Hans and Sophie were raised by their evangelical Christian mother, who was not Catholic, yet they still came into this Catholicism because of a friend of... He didn't start out... They didn't start as friends, but Hans met somebody in his unit, in the DJ-11, by the name of Odell Eicher and... He eventually one day explored Otto's parish church and discovered books by St. Augustine, particularly the Confessions. And he began to see these new symbols, and he saw beauty in what the Catholic Church was. So that was another form, I mean, a beginning of dissent. And eventually Hans graduated secondary educations, but as with any citizen in Europe, I mean, not Europe, but Germany during that time, he could not advance to university until after he served a six-month term, what the Germans called Reichsarbeitsdienst. Not really good with the German pronunciation, but I'm trying. They like to shove entire sentences into one word, but basically what this was was a national labor service, or a closest comparison that I could think of Civic duty. You have to go to jury duty, right? So, and that's your civic duty to your country in a way. The Greeks also had something similar where you had to serve a particular term in the Senate. And that's basically what this was. You had to serve this term of service to your country before you could go on to any sort of higher education. And he still did this 
period of time, even though he was a little more free spirited by then, he wanted to get into university. And he even did an 18 month period serving in the military. And the reason why I say, despite the fact that he was free spirited, um, he would write home about singing songs for the German country and pride in serving his homeland. And while this comes later, this was after this uh, Operation Barbosa started after he was in university already. But his views on the military, of course, would change during Operation Barbosa on the Russian front, where and it is commonly cited that the Eastern Front for Germany was one of the most gruesome fronts of the war. That was Germany fighting Russia invading. There was a lot of horrors. And going east, Russia and Germany had conflicts over Poland. Going through Poland, you're going to see the concentration camps. And Hans would see things like this. And that's another reason for why, while in the military, he began to doubt his country. Why he wanted to resist it. Why he didn't agree with the Nazi regime anymore. But yet again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We need to take a step back because Sophie during this time was beginning to develop her own identity. She met a man who was a occupationally military person. And his name was Fritz Hartnagel. And they would commonly exchange letters as Fritz was in the military he would be taken all over Germany. They could never really interact person to person. And they would exchange letters all the time. And it was in many of Sophie's letters that you could begin to see she's starting to doubt things. And one of the biggest events where she began to question things was after Hitler invaded Poland because she began to see this as unnecessary. The takeover of the Sudetenland, well, that was just a national pride thing these people were germans they deserved to be part of the true country but poland had nothing to do with this and she saw that and she wrote a letter to um fritz expressing discomfort with what was going on basically and uh a quote from one of these letters was, You and your men must have plenty to do now. I just can't grasp that people's lives are now under constant threat from other people. I'll never understand it, and I find it terrible. Don't go telling me it's for the sake of the fatherland. And like I said, at that point, it was no longer about the fatherland. They, Germany was beginning to invade places now. It wasn't taking over previously inhabited country. No, it was taking over other people now. Eventually, I mean, uh, Hans had this on and off thing with the military. He would be called back in every once in a while. But after he served his compulsory term, he came back to Germany and would went, went into medical school at Munich's Ludwig Maximilians University. This is also where Sophie would eventually come to. And while he was there, he, of course, was there for medical school. And I'm sure his mother had some inspiration in that. He's, uh, he took the chance to study other things. Like we do at Westminster, we have the opportunity to study the sciences if we're in a history major. And he took advantage of his ability to pick other things. So he chose Greek and philosophy, where he studied people like Plato, Nietzsche, several other higher up and these actually became key figures in their resistance they would use their words as forms of showing other people saying things against higher governments that were exercising too much control and sophie wouldn't join until much later in 1942 i know i'm not giving a clear timeline my apologies i didn't exactly get all the dates for this but she didn't join until 1942 and Hans and Sophie were about two years apart when it came to university but she wouldn't be able to join because she kept getting delayed time after time uh, because her 
National Labor Service was not being recognized. She kept doing uh, teaching assistance type stuff. And she was being like a kindergarten teacher and stuff like that. But they kept refusing to recognize that as a uh, compulsory labor service. So it was aggravating for her, but eventually she found something to do and was able to get into university to study with her brother. And while there, they both uh, became really close together and they were more of friends than they had been before. And they would begin to in, uh, intermingle their friend groups and stuff like that. And this is where uh, the White Rose began to actually develop and they became connected to one philosophy teacher uh, by the name of Kurt Huber, who I'll talk about more in a minute. But, well, now I'm talking about him. Sorry. But while they found an ally in Huber, they faced a level of difficulty in the fact that most of the student body in Munich was devoutly Nazi. So they had occasional allies in the student body, but there was a massive majority in Munich, that was for the Nazi party. They were actively participating in the Hitler Youth. And if they were to openly express any sort of dissent, they would be immediately reported to the Gestapo. So they had to be a little bit more covert about this. And unfortunately, where Hans had the ability to study philosophy in Greek, the... By the time Sophie came, they basically took the learning element out of it, or the predominantly learning element out of it, and turned it into a place where they could foster the Nazi ideology, where they could just shove it down your throat every single second to remind you and to keep you devoted to the cause. Um, while it wasn't really a rebellion, I couldn't find a better word to describe this event, but... Uh, eventually one professor got sacked from the university because he was a little bit too freely expressive of things. And he was a liked professor. Um, the authorities relied on the fact that like, oh, the students are just going to realize he's gone and not keep going to his classes. That's where they were wrong. And they actually kept trying to go to his classes and eventually tried to investigate where he went. So they went to the chancellor's office, who was basically like the dean um, they just called them the chancellor and wanted to find out what happened. The chancellor just locked himself away in his office. And eventually the students scattered when they found out that he had just gotten fired. This was one of the kind of bigger events that was outside of the White Rose, but still kind of showed the students were noticing things. It's like, well, hey, we liked this professor. Why are they gone? Sophie began to make friends with many women at the university after the, particularly the chancellor, but also the university had these sentiments where it's like women should be ha uh, home having more children to serve Hitler rather than being here at the university. You shouldn't be here. Go have children. And it's like uh, Sophie was very, she wanted to be independent. She didn't want to have that lifestyle of just being a stay-at-home mom. And she began to make friends and create bonds with people who were also not interested in this idea. Many of them were women. Um, there were many other women who believed, hey, I should be able to study here too. So she created friendships. And there was a point in time in May of 1942 where Sophie boarded with one of the professors at the university. His name was Professor Muth. And Professor Muth was not very keen on the Nazi party either, and he would bring in dissenting groups and dissenting intellectuals, and she came in contact with these people so she could develop networks. And Hans would become friends with a bookstore owner by the name of Joseph Songen, who he voted Nazi but never joined them, so he was kind of in this political gray area. The Nazis couldn't do anything about him. He's voting, uh, Nazi. He's not voting against. He's not voting for the Communist Party. So he's not openly against us, but he never joined the uh, Nazi Party. And he kept this off limits room that he dedicated to banned books that he would only show to people he became friendly with. He would often visit the university and associate with students and stuff like that. Those he felt he was close enough to, he would show this room. And Hans and, uh, 
Son Sungen would have conversations over dinner about these types of books, these types of subjects. And through the networking that I discussed earlier, Hans, Hans kicked off a lot of this, but Sophie did have her part in it. I know I'm not talking about her as much, and I realize I think later on I don't talk about her as much, but she did have her part in this. But Hans would use connections to obtain key elements in distributing eventually pamphlets or leaflets that the White Rose used to show dissent. They didn't publicly show dissent. They would distribute anonymously these leaflets on trains, and he obtained a portable typewriter that he could take from place to place, type up these leaflets, and then a print machine that he could use to copy and mass-produce these things. And the, dis the given how widely they were dispersing these, it did not take long for the Gestapo and other authorities to take notice. There were many people loyal to the party who would turn in their pamphlets and be like, well, there's there's this thing happening. You should be concerned. And, of course, there were a lot of people also who turned in their pamphlets because they were worried about repercussions. If they had kept these pamphlets and didn't disclose that they had received them, that was actually an offense against the Nazi party. And they would distribute about six or seven of these leaflets with different messages on each of them over the course of the following years. So they were active from 1942 to 1943 as the White Rose. Uh, and each of these leaflets, I don't have any examples up on screen, but there are several examples. Um, there are many preserved copies of their leaflets. And if you look at their leaflets, you can see the inspirations of their education on the leaflets they're using. Like I specifically pointed out Plato for what Hans was learning, and it's because he actually does quote readings from Plato in one of the pamphlets. The Catholicism element was important too because he cites many Christian uh, elements. There's Christian inspirations in his leaflets. So you can see that these things had inspiration on him. So he took the messages of being against overbearing governments and stuff like that from all of these different sources, these classical educations that he was receiving, and put them into leaflets and showed there are other people throughout history that did this. You can do this too. And eventually they got about six or seven different leaflets out and the final one they were distributing at their own university but they were caught doing so and their plan was they placed stacks of leaflets in front of every single lecture room door so when students exited they would notice these leaflets and start to read them that would be if they went uncaught anyway unfortunately Sophie got a little passionate and she decided to do something that was not planned she had extra leaflets and she went to the top of a large staircase that oversaw the uh, main hall of the university and scattered them all over this entrance hall and i say unfortunately because had they not done this they would have gone uncaught but because she went all the way up to do that, she came across a maintenance man who was also a part-time stormtrooper, which, no, not Star Wars, but you can see where they got the idea from. They basically were another Nazi loyalist paramilitary group. And he saw Sophie doing this, and he just raise the alarm throughout the entire university to have them arrested. So they closed off all the entrances and exits and made sure the students didn't find these pamphlets and arrested them. They gave up willingly, but Sophie had to quickly run and hide something that would implicate one of their allies. But unfortunately, Hans had a few things in his pockets, particularly a first draft leaflet for the final leaflet that they had. So this first draft was not written by him, it was written by somebody else, and they were able to use the handwriting to 
implicate another member, and he had other things that they could trace back to different people, and this would lead to them getting captured. And through, in, they also, the Gestapo would interrogate them after, of course, they're not going to just use these small elements, they're going to interrogate them and find out, who else do you know that's helping you? Because they want to stop any form of dissent possible. They're not going to allow anybody else to just stick around just because they caught these two instigators. No, they want to find everybody and tear out everything from the roots. And after the interrogations, other allies were found. And uh, Hans, Sophie, and Christoph Propst who was another founding member that I didn't discuss, but he was a founding one of the three founding members, they were charged with high treason. And they were given the charge. They still had to go to court. So they were escorted to the Palace of Justice, which is where all the court proceedings were handled. And this is where their official trial would occur in, what, in the Nazi courts that were also known as the uh, People's Courts. That's what they were formerly known as, and these were purely Nazi-run courts. And when I say Nazi-run, I mean everything they did was tied to what the Nazi party was. Any rulings that happened were based off of Nazi party ideologies. They weren't based off of a sense of justice like we have in the United States. There was no fair trial. It was solely based on whether or not the judge was a devout Nazi, and unfortunately, the judge for this one was particularly a very much devout Nazi. And his name was actually Judge Friesler, and he was an infamous judge because he served out, I believe, 2,000 sentences over the course of his term. And he took pride in his work. Uh, the actually brought in spectators for this trial. It was supposed to be a public spectacle. And there was... It, it was supposed to be a show, basically, because you need to make a show. Bread, panem et corkum. Bread and circuses. Basically find ways to distract the people. And if you're going to make a spectacle of people who dissent from your ideology make a show of them to other people. And there was little spectacle in it, though, because um, Sophie and Hans were very calm with everything. And um, the only commotion... Well, I will also say that the third person who was being tried uh, made several attempts to speak he tried pointing out things about the Eastern Front and what was happening. He wanted to protect the German people from that, but he was immediately shot down by Friesler. Friesler basically ranted the entire time during this trial. And there are um, transcripts of this. And there was a commotion eventually, and it was because Robert and Magdalena Scholl burst their way into the courtroom hearing that their children were basically being tried for high treason. And this created a spectacle of sorts. And eventually Magdalena asked the judge that was residing, not the judge, but the uh, attorney that was residing over Sophie Hans. And uh, it was another one of the Scholl children. I'm sorry. I, there are certain elements I forgot, but... Certain parts of the narrative I was looking at got confusing. This is during a time where records were scarce of certain things, and a lot of records were destroyed, so certain things can be um, scattered sometimes when putting together a full narrative. Anyway, I, I'm rambling. Magdalena fainted when she realized that her children would be put to death, had to be carried out. She tried to come back in, but they wouldn't let her. She was eventually finally let back in when she wanted to make an appeal to the judge as the mother of these three kids. So they took Robert out, brought her in, 
until um, Friesler finally just had enough with everything that was happening. He wanted order in his courtroom, and he just got everything orderly and finally issued the death sentence. Sophie, Hans, and their sibling that was with them would all be put to death. And they were taken out of public eye for this because there was talk of, let's hang them in front of their school. Make a public spectacle of this. There were people, other people, that were going, wait, they're going to be made martyrs, though. We don't want that to happen. We can't have it be public. If we have it public, people will see this and go, oh, these people are heroes for what they were doing. So they took them, stashed them away in a secretive location, away from the public eye, and executed all three of them by guillotine. And, well, an unfortunate way to learn, apparently the Nazis used guillotines. The more you know. Sorry to break up such a uh, dire topic with uh, a joke. It would seem a little bit distasteful, but at the same time, I know this can get a little bit heavy for certain people. This is World War II, and it is a hard time for a lot of people. So let's come back to this, and there was, of course, an aftermath. There were still actually some people who continued to copy and circulate the leaflets of the White Rose, and there were a couple other White Rose trials, about four over the next few months, but instead of putting them to death, since they weren't the main instigators, they were just followers, they were given prison sentences. The Scholl family members were not an exception, except for one brother. His name was Werner, and he was actually serving in the military on the Russian front. He was not instigated in this, but everybody else in the family was arrested and brought in for trial because there was this concept of that family, in Nazi Germany anyway, that families will share responsibility for crimes committed by one of their members. And since three of their children basically created a resistance movement, they were to be instigated as well. Three were acquitted. It would Magdalena and two of her kids were acquitted because they were having health issues. Um, Robert, though, he was still vehemently vehemently, pardon, against the Nazi regime, and he was given a two-year sentence in 1943 and was freed just before the end of the war. So he served his full sentence. And eventually that sixth leaflet that they had was smuggled out of Germany by somebody, and it was smuggled to the Allied forces in Britain or to the United States. Well, it was shown to the Allied forces, and they saw, oh, there's resistance inside the country. There were these students that actually tried rising up against what the Nazi party served. We should make propaganda of this. So they made copies galore of these leaflets and just airdropped them over Germany, just to let them fall over the place for people to see. And this was retitled as the Manifesto of the Students of Munich. So the Allied forces were actually seeing this resistance and tried to weaponize it. I haven't seen anything on how effective that was, but still, we can show that even though this wasn't a huge military movement or anything like that, like the Allied forces were against Germany, the Allied forces took notice of this and saw it was impactful, so they tried using it as propaganda. So why does it matter now? I kept saying at the beginning that it's like this can be applicable now. We've seen a huge problem in the last couple of years in that there's been a rise in authoritarian leaders, Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, and a bunch of others, and unfortunately, our country is no exception, and we've seen Donald Trump elected to the White House. 
and he has expressed many, many characteristics of an authoritarian leader. And he even emulates Hitler in certain regards. And I actually went through looking at his actions, the things he's done over the last couple of years, and compared. And it's terrifying because uh, Trump does do many things that Hitler did. He will put down anything that he does not agree with, any news against him, he'll just call fake news. Hitler had a method of this very similar. It was basically a, discrediting the media that did not agree with his regime, his point of view. Trump is basically doing that now, and there's a lot of people who are scarily following this. Uh, he's got a direct line to a lot of his supporters through Twitter. Twitter doesn't have to go through, I mean, it does go through censorship, but not political censorship at times. So Trump can tweet something out, and all of his followers will see that. They will absorb that. Hitler had something similar to this, too, where he had the Nazi party distribute radios with only one channel on it that was tuned to Nazi propaganda. So Hitler would speak through it. They would hear that. They wouldn't hear anything else on these radios. And th these are just a couple of examples. There are a lot of different things that you can take from what Trump is doing and compare it to Hitler and find there are some similarities. Trump emulating an authoritarian leader at times, and it's worrisome. But that's why I wanted to do this, to why I wanted to show this. It's... If you look at us, or uh, a lot of you looking at this are going to be students studying here at Westminster. We're a liberal arts university. We know what Trump is doing is wrong. We, can, we have a diverse education that shows us things like this. But a lot of the times the question comes up, what can we do about it? And that's why I bring up the story of the Shoals. That's why I cover them so deeply. What, uh, and even their growth. They didn't start out against the regime, but they grew as they realized there were certain things wrong. I want to show that, of course, not everybody's going to be perfect and not everybody's immediately going to be against this at first. But there are people who were against it from the beginning, like their father. And then there were people who needed to take time to see certain elements of it, like Hans and Sophie. And I want people to know that even though it seems like there's a lot of people that support him, there are people who can begin to realize what he's doing is wrong. And I also want students to know that they can still make a difference. They can do things that will... Change, cause change. If Hans and Sophie could create a movement that created a massive amount of worry in the Nazi party, then we as students can too. In the recent years, there have been students going to women's marches up at the Capitol. There have been women's marches in Washington, D.C. even, but there's a lot of the things our students are doing at Westminster that are showing that even students can show a level of resistance and create some change. You don't have to be a big military resistance to create any level of change. Things can start at the ground as well. That's why I wanted to do this thesis. And if you're still following me here, thank you. This is actually the end. I just had a lot of a passion for this and I'm if you followed along until this point yet again thank you so much it means a lot to me this has been a passion project for the last four years and I really wanted to show people that there was resistance in Germany and we can still take knowledge from that resistance and apply it to today it doesn't history doesn't stop 
it can inform the future. We can take information from what we've learned in history and apply it to today and to tomorrow. So thank you for viewing my presentation, and I hope you have a good day.